Welcome to Arise's brand new arts, culture, music and lifestyle programme. I'm Hannah Poole in London. They say clothes make the man. We meet Oswald Boateng, the man who makes the clothes, Britain's most famous and flamboyant menswear designer. Artist Kimanthi Donkor invites us into his studio for a very modern take on centuries of African history. And we challenge Western stereotypes and head to Benin, where voodoo is alive and well and thriving. Oswald Boateng is one of the most exciting names in British fashion. His immaculate tailoring and acid bright linings have added more than just a dash of excitement to Savile Row. Born in North London to Ghanaian parents, he sewed his first suit aged eight on his mother's sewing machine. In 2012, Queen Elizabeth awarded him an OBE, Officer of the British Empire. Arise News' Heather Scott caught up with him in Davos. So we have a very interesting opportunity with Africa where there is a new uh, kind of re-energized, refocused look at Africa because before, and which was always a problem, was everyone looked at Africa as a big charity case and everyone kind of discounted that it controls 50% to 60% of all known natural resources. So this clearly not a charity case. The question is, is why is it not accessing its own wealth? And that all relates to infrastructure. So once the infrastructure is in place, it can more than just afford to pay for know-how resources. It's, it can play, actually play a very significant part in the world economy and maybe redressing some of the balances and deficits, you know? You're a world famous designer. I mean, your suits are worn by rock stars, royalty, anybody you can name it, and they are very distinctive. If somebody is out there, some youngster out there, how do you get to be you? Uh, well, first of all, you've got to believe in what you do. You've got to love what you do. And uh, uh, you have to put the time. Um, I think really is, I think you've got to love it, you know. Um, it's, it's a long process. It's not a short process. There's no shortcut to success. And also success is a funny thing, you know. You know, there's financial success and there's success of notoriety. And I think, um, I think it's very important to just do what you love and everything will fall into place. And that's what, effectively that's what I've done. I heard that when you were a young boy, you, you, you were so sure of your style that when you were designing your own clothes, even if it was hot, you wouldn't take your jackets off <laughs> because you didn't want to ruin the look. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, in, in the early years, you have to be very clear about what your style is and what, is, um, what you're creating as an image, as a designer. And, and that's a very important part of being a designer. You've got to, you've got to represent a certain uh, image, you know, and, and it's actually not image, it's concept. So you have concept. What's the difference between concept and image? Well, I, I'm going to say there's concept designers, product designers. And so concept designers create, um, which is what I am, which is uh, we first understand completely why we're creating. And when we understand that, then it's possible to hang the product on that. And that can actually extend beyond clothing. That can extend even to design of cars or getting into a master plan of a, a continent because you understand the language of why you're creating. Whereas you have product designer, product driven design, you're interested only in the product. And so I've always looked at why. And the main reason for that is when I discovered I had a talent for designing, I went to a store, and I must have been 17 or 18 years old, and uh, I met a buyer, and he said to me, you know, I showed him some drawings, and he said, so why did you do it? And I said, because it, it looks good. He says, no, what's the concept? And it took me a while for me to understand, and I understood he was asking me, 
why am I driven to do it? And then once I understood that, then that opened my mind on creativity as a whole. J'apprends. La confiance des autres donne le pouvoir de conquérir et de se dépasser. But you overturned one of the stuffiest institutions in Britain, which is Savile Row. Um, how did they, when you bought into Savile Row, what was the reaction to you? I mean, you were so alien to that stuffy tradition. Mm. How did you do it? Well, I think is is first and foremost, I'm not about breaking traditions, right? Because part of the, the uh, attraction to it was its tradition and its heritage for centuries. So that's what I loved about it. So, but I knew it needed to evolve. See, all traditions have to evolve or eventually they break. Or, so um, when I got at Savro, it was all about how do I evolve this tradition? How do I help it find its new footing for the future? And I understood it because it just required more design and I needed to open their minds because effectively a tailor is effectively a couturier that you have for women. And they didn't understand that they were. So the opportunities of couturier are vast. Opportunities for a tailor are quite limited. And so that's why I came up with a concept which was bespoke couture, which is a fusion of the two worlds. One of your signatures is your linings. Uh, nobody else used to do linings like this. I mean, you know, initially it started in lining, then it went to shirts and ties and eventually onto the suit itself. But colour was just a tool to make something very traditional in a modern way. And I was very specific about the choice of colour. You know, in, in, within every band of colour, there's probably a thousand different shades. So I'm very particular about the shade because you get the right shade, then everyone can wear colour. What is so fantastic is that men's suiting up until the point of view was navy blue, grey, if you're very unlucky, brown, mm. and a pinstripe or whatever. You allowed men to fly. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, the, and the main reason for that is, is it just it needed a shake-up, it needed a revitalization. And I think, you know, that process is still, still happening. Africa is the second fastest growing economy in the world. So, so everybody's looking towards Africa for where the growth is. Um, do you find that because of that now, and there's, a, there's an excitement about Africa? Yeah, I'm looking at ways of setting up manufacturing in Africa and I'm being quite creative about how that can be done. There's a billion or so people live on that continent and it clearly is a new market for the rest of the world like China or India was. And, um, and in a way, I think it's... Um, it, not a way, it, I know it has a much, much more potential than China or India. A quick look now at some of the other fashion headlines around the world this week. In Pakistan, a Nigerian labels wowed the crowds at Karachi Fashion Week. Designer Joseph Adebayo Adegbe's innovative outfits use artificial leaves and chiffon. His green-themed clothing line appears to be made entirely from foliage. The soil in Africa is great. The soil, we, we could be able to cultivate, do uh, mechanized farming and be able to produce uh, food that could be able to feed the large population in Africa. But we're not doing that. That's why I decided to do this particular campaign to showcase green, to showcase that Africa is green, the world is green. We could be able to produce what could be able to feed Africa and from African ground. And then apart from that, you could be trendy and we could be fashionable. In Senegal, Muslim women are fusing fashion and faith at the evening of the veil. The collection showcases long black robes, silk blouses, and African print trousers worn with colorful scarves. Held in the capital, Dakar, the evening's designed to show that veils can also be elegant and fashionable. And Berlin Fashion Weeks added a new jewel to its crown with its first ever Africa Fashion Day. The goal is to bring African fashion into the mainstream and to create a platform for Africans living in Europe. In Togo, a new way for aspiring young storytellers to share their stories. Poetry Slam. Poetry, rhythm and rap. 
This is Poetry Slam, a unique art form that combines poetry with rhythmic oral storytelling. In a packed hall in the capital city, Lome, young aspiring poets battle it out on the microphone. I'd always heard about Creme of Slam, but I'd never experienced it. I'd never seen it before, and for a first, this is just great. The audience was very supportive. They did not intimidate me and did not treat me like I was green at this. They treated me like a star. It's beautiful and it encourages me, allows me to give of myself more and go as far as I can with this. No subject is taboo. Today's topics range from philosophy to football. At weekends, the young poets run workshops with children, encouraging them to express themselves through Poetry Slam. What's interesting about Slam is there are Slam poets who've realised they can do Slam in the local language. It's allowed many more together and made Slam less elitist. People have come to realise that Slam is something that they share, especially within a society that's more conservative, a society that's not used to expressing itself. Slam has allowed many people to express themselves. Slam in Togo is evolving. I really want to say this because we realise now that in Togo, Slam is no longer at the beginner's level. We passed that stage. It is at a level where young Togolese slam poets are currently promoting slam to a level where they can now express themselves through slam. Because it's like poetry that is sung. It's a really beautiful art, and young Togolese people have really taken to it. A creative outlet for young people to share the issues close to their hearts, poetry slam is already spreading across Togo. Coming up next in Arise's brand new arts, music and culture programme, painter Kimathi Donkor shows us around his London studio. And we head to Benin to bust some of those Western stereotypes about voodoo. Welcome back to Arise's brand new arts, music, lifestyle and culture programme. Still to come, we challenge those tired old Western stereotypes about voodoo. And we meet the women of Mali who've built an entire industry growing and processing local shear nuts into food and cosmetics. But first, painter Kamathi Doncor joins us right here in his London studio. Kamathi's Ghanaian, Jamaican, British and Jewish heritage infuses his work. His paintings are vibrant and powerful. Kamathi, thank you so much for having us here in your studio. We're surrounded by this incredible work of yours. How do you describe it? Well, I suppose I could describe it as a mixture of history painting and portraiture. So I work with um, historical ideas, um, these particular series of paintings were amongst are called um, Queens of the Undead and they're looking at four different African sort of um, women from history. But they're also portraits of contemporary um, black British or African heritage women and people. So there's a sort of mixture between these two forms. And so why did you choose these four queens in particular? I, I'm not sure why I chose them, but what I can say is that there is a sort of... Um, a thread which runs through the stories of all these four women, which is that unusually for their time and for now, they were all military leaders. So, um, because they're not queens as such, are they? Well, actually, two of them were actual real life bona fide royalty queens with a heritage and all of that stuff. Um, in fact, so, um, the, the one from Ghana, Yara Santawa, she still has you know royal relatives. So in the sort of Ghanaian royal family, or the Ashanti royal family, as I should probably call it. Um, but two of the others were um, slaves, so those two aren't really queens. Although, the other thing about them is that all of them are national heroes in their own country. So although we in England might not have heard of them, and in, perhaps in a different country they might not have heard of them either, in their own countries, these women are all highly revered. They're sort of on banknotes, they're statues to them, they're on, they have TV programs and statues. Tell us about this painting. Okay, so this painting is called When Shall We Three? And it depicts a scene from the life of Queen Njinga from Angola in southwest Africa. She lived in the 17th century. And um, at that time, Portugal was sort of trying to establish a colonial itself as a colonial power in Angola. So what happened was that Njinga was sent 
to have a negotiation with the Portuguese governor de Souza. And when she entered into the room with de Souza, um, he was sort of sitting on his like throne and there was a, a mat placed in front of him and you know all the courtiers were standing around and Nzinga was given to understand that she was supposed to sit down on this mat in front of the Sousa and maybe assume a position of subordination but according to her biographer an Italian called Cavazzi Nzinga was very quick thinking um, a very quick thinking royal princess and she clapped her hands or clicked her fingers and one of her servants sort of went and um, you know, prostrated themselves sort of on all fours and formed a bench for Njinga to sit upon. And this completely changed the whole, you know, body language, power politics between these two sort of um, characters as they sought an advantage in this diplomatic um, meeting. The, the Harriet Tubman painting, mm. tell us what's happening in that scene. So Harriet Tubman, um, she was, as I said, a leader of the Underground Railroad. And what that meant is that she had escaped from slavery in the southern states of, of the United States. But rather than just sort of, you know, setting up home and sort of enjoying, you know, her newfound freedom in the North or in, in Canada, as many people did, she was sort of driven to by some, you know, very powerful feeling of duty and obligation to other members of her community and family in Maryland, where she was, where she'd fled. And so she returned ten times over the next um, sort of ten or so years and rescued 70 people from slavery, sort of bringing them um, over land, over, you know, through woods, forests, snows, often in winter time, um, to the northern states where they could be free or even into Canada when that became impossible in the United States. So one um, incident is told in her biography when um, she said that on an occasion, and probably more than one occasion, if uh, 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 one of the people she was sort of, you know, leading to freedom said, I can't go on any longer, it's just too much, you know, this trick. And, and, and so she had to, how can I say, um, persuade him with the threat really of death. And, you know, it's a, it's, it's, to me, it's a very disturbing kind of thought that you almost have to force someone to be free. But in that, time in that place to leave someone to leave a straggler would have meant that he would be captured probably tortured by the sort of um you know the slave powers in in america at the time and that would sort of give away you know the whole position of of her group and so you know there could be no one left behind you had to bring everyone so this painting just really focuses on that one this terrible kind of you know conflict or drama that takes place in in harriet's biography your work is, I mean, it's very vibrant, there's lots of colour mm. and the images are beautiful. There's often also um, a political message within there. Does, does all art have to be political? I think all life is political, Hannah. <laughs> I mean, if by politics we mean it in our general sense in that, you know, people struggle for influence, power, control, freedom or whatever it is that we think we're struggling for. And I don't think art can ever be apart from that. In fact, many of my paintings are thinking about art itself because for example I'm using um, a lot of the figures are actually based on well actually all of the figures are based on paintings or drawings from the time of these women by famous um, British often or other European painters so for example I have a painting of Nanny of the Maroons Nanny of the Maroons the figure I've taken from a painting by Reynolds of a famous British aristocrat called Jane Fleming Jane Fleming's family were plantation owners in Jamaica. They, so they were sort of involved in the slave trade and enslaving you know, thousands of people, and that's what made them wealthy. So when Reynolds is painting this painting, he's being paid by them. The money is coming to Reynolds, who, by the way, is the founder of the British Royal Academy. So the money is coming to Reynolds to make this portrait from slavery itself. So to me, that's political as well. I'm not saying that Reynolds supported slavery or anything like that, but there is a political element to all art, just as there is to all life. And so I try in my paintings to sort of, you know, make that a bit more visible in some ways. Tell us what you're working on at the moment. 
Okay, so I've got a couple of shows coming up and one of them is at, um, it's called Art 13. It's a brand new art fair, which is going to be at the Olympia Grand Hall in Kensington in London. And the other thing that's coming up is a show of some paintings at the, the Usher Gallery, which is in the collection in Lincoln, just near Lincoln Cathedral. Good luck with that, Kamathi. And thank you so much for having us here in your studio. Moving on now, let's take a quick look at the film headlines around the world. Music fans from all over the world are flocking to a small South African record store. Mabu Vinyl, a quirky music shop in the heart of Cape Town, is featured in the BAFTA-winning and Oscar-nominated documentary Searching for Sugar Man. The film shows Mabu Vinyl co-owner Steven Siegerman on his mission to track down American musician Rodriguez. The film tells the story of a struggling singer who's surprised to discover he's a cult hero in South Africa. Thanks for keeping me alive. Siegerman says he never imagined the story of his search for Rodriguez would become an award-winning film. Uh, eventually it became a search and then it became a, a discovery and then it became a tour and then it became a website and then it became uh, a re-releasing of Rodriguez's albums and then it became a meeting with Malik Benjelal, a Swedish TV journalist who was just looking for short stories. And here we are now in, in, in 2013 and we've been honoured with an Oscar nomination. So. I truly didn't intend that to happen when all those years ago, but I've, when you look back always at your life and your adventures, it makes perfect sense how you got there. It's always difficult to see forward, but this has just been a wonderful, wonderful journey. A 16-year-old girl from a Ugandan slum is having her life story made into a Disney feature film. Fiona Mutesi is the only woman to ever represent Uganda on the international chess circuit. She learned to play when she was just nine years old, homeless and starving, when a community center offered her a free cup of porridge in exchange for a chess lesson. Mutesi's chess career has lifted her family out of poverty, and the young prodigy says she wants to become a grandmaster. I have no training, enough training, because we don't have much support. If you want to be a grandmaster, you have to play many tournaments, international tournaments. And right now I have no support. Can't go out to play other tournaments because it's a bit expensive. In the apartheid era, they were separating and a film called Dear Mandela is focusing on the challenges still facing today's South Africans. We are going to build houses for you. It is not something that we can achieve overnight. The documentary follows three residents of a slum known as Kennedy Road as they fight to save their homes. And it's intended as a reminder of the struggles and sacrifices made by South Africans during the apartheid era. We definitely wise. wanted to focus on young people. Um, we really wanted the, the, the story in Dear Mandela to focus on what the new generation in South Africa was feeling, what their lives were like, what was important to them. Um, and so Mazwi, Miguelo and Zama really um, kind of gravitated towards us and, and us towards them just through their kind of leadership, through their charisma. Um, and just the fact that they had um, just a, a really amazing vision of, of South Africa, what South Africa could be. Shearbutt is incredible. It's the beauty industry's secret. It's set to fight wrinkles, sun damage and help psoriasis and eczema. We head now to Mali, where the group of enterprising women have turned a traditional shearnut farm into a modern and thriving industry. We are in Mali at a farm, 180 kilometers from Bamako, where the sheer nut trees grow. Here, female farmers transform these small nuts into sheer butter, which is rich and fabulous. This is why it is widely used in Mali and the rest of the world. The butter is very popular because it can be used for everything. You can cook with it and it can keep you warm during cold nights. Or you can rub the butter on your tired feet and even on your pregnant tummy. For centuries, people have found many functions for the butter. Your hair looks good as well. The most popular consumers are women. The owners know their customers very well. They 
There are 608 women spread among 28 villages who work for Kopro Kazan. The cooperation is very important for their emancipation. The women are doing well. Copro Kazan produces 50 to 60 grams of Beru de Karité a year and mainly focus on quality butter. The two biggest customers are the cosmetic and food industry. We export the shea butter mostly to Senegal. If we can sell it in Europe, it will become a good business. Butter for beauty. For women by women. Africa's colonial rulers tried to stamp out local voodoo practices. Christian missionaries described it as the work of the devil. But voodoo survived, and in many communities, voodoo sits comfortably alongside other religions. We dig beyond the Hollywood hype now and head to Benin, where voodoo is practiced by almost a quarter of the population. To most, the word voodoo conjures up a negative image in one's mind. One can't help but to think of occults, witchcraft, black magic and cults. It's a god, a little god, for the people of Wida. It's a very good god because it never harms anyone and it knows everyone. If, for example, you have some problems, you can come and see the python and it's possible that the python will help you. So it's something that protects us and it's very respected in Wida. However, to others, voodoo is a belief misunderstood. Voodoo, since its conception in the Western Hemisphere, has been the target of countless opponents depicting it as being a sinister and abominable belief that possesses anyone who dares engage in its practice. In the time of Kereku, when we had so-called scientific socialism, the practice of voodoo was forbidden. It was this ban on the practice of voodoo that caused all political problems and social economic crisis in our country. Socialism has no place on the soul of Daome. That's it for this edition of Arise TV's brand new arts and culture programme. Thank you for joining us. I'm Hannah Poole and we leave you now with these beautiful images from the work of painter Kimathi Donkor.